Um, so for 6.40, which was... Um, Can you all see this okay? This marker will get darker in a bit. In the um, back there. Um, okay, if you can't, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the wave is given as... Uh, the incident wave is E is equal to 10 cosine of omega t minus beta 1 z. Omega t minus beta 1 z. Go ahead. In the ax direction, plus 20 cosine omega t minus beta 1 z plus pi over 3. Oh plus pi over 3. In the ay direction, um, volts per meter. That's fine. It's, but we're going to default unit for volts per meter. Okay. Let's see if there's any. It's a little darker. I'm going to use this one. All right, go ahead. What's the question? Um, so uh, epsilon r in medium 1 is equal to 16. Let me do it this way. This is medium 1 and medium 2, right? Mm -hmm. Medium 1 epsilon relative is, go ahead. Uh, equal to 16. And yeah. non-magnetic? Uh, uh, it does not state a mu r. Oh, yes, it is non-magnetic. All right, so it means mu relative here is 1, mu relative here is 1. Uh, uh, it, the second medium is magnetic, mu r is 12. Oh, gosh. Medium. This is a different kind of problem. It's 12. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And then epsilon r is equal to 6. All right. And what do they need? Um, they want you to find the reflected and transmitted E wave. This is a good problem. Mainly because they're trying to make it comp more complicated than need be. All right, does it give a frequency? No. All right, that's a hint. If it doesn't give a frequency, you know it can't be lossy with this stuff. And if you look here, is there anything where a sigma value or an alpha value is given? So you know there's no loss here, right? Now the thing is that we need, we really need the transmission coefficient here and the reflection coefficient, right? So we need at the boundary both the transmission and reflection coefficients. Do you agree with me? How many understand this? Okay. So how do we get that? We well, we know in general the reflection coefficient is equal to eta two minus eta one over eta two plus eta one. This is an this is a uh, where eta is the intrinsic impedance of the regions. One thing I need to tell you too, that's a, the eta there is the intrinsic impedance. There is something that looks very similar to it, and that is called the index of refraction, but it's not a script then. It is a small n. And actually, this is really a Greek symbol, it's eta. But I, I cannot, I have it not within me to differentiate that when I handle it. So it, it has to do with the usage. Now these values, 82, 81, have to do with the constitutive parameters in the, in, the, in the media. In general, when we talk about eta, it's equal to the square root of j omega mu over sigma plus j omega epsilon. Now that's general. You always go there. There is no sigma, is there, class? Everybody follow? There's no sigma. So now we'll get eta one and eta two in the respective regions. And I want everybody to watch this so you can appreciate it. Let's go to the general equation and just modify it. No sigma, right? No problem. You can both, everybody can see the J omega is canceled, don't they? So now we know the intrinsic impedance is not a function of frequency, but rather the ratio of mu over epsilon in the respective region. Let me go a step further. What I always do is break this out in terms of square root of mu naught over epsilon naught times square root of mu relative over epsilon relative in the regions. Does everybody follow me? Because both mu and epsilon are determined by their relative and their free, I'll call it free space values, right? How many understand where I'm at right now? With me? Okay, so now what I'll do is go a step further yet. Now I can say that's 120 pi times square root of mu relative over epsilon relative. I hope I'm answering your question systematically. Right? 
because mu naught over epsilon naught is 120 pi or about 377 ohms, right? And you can use either. Now, what happens is I get eta in region one here is 120 pi right, times the square root of mu naught. Well, I mean, times the square root of mu relative is one over the square root of 16. Or it's simply 120 over 4, over 4 pi, and that would be 30 pi. Does everybody understand that? So now I have the intrinsic impedance in region 1. May I ask how many people tried this problem? You looked at it. Did you guys look at it? Good. If you looked at it, I can, I can only encourage you to keep up with the homework. The reason is many times you look at one or two problems and say, I got this and you get very, very casual about it, and then it bites you. I'm warning you uh, as a friend now. All right, that's eta one. What about eta two? How do we get eta two? It's got sigma zero, so we default to this, 125 squared of mu relative over epsilon over. But neither one of those is one. So we have 125. And here we're going to have the square root of mu relative. Is it 12? Is that, am I right? Mm -hmm. We have 12 over epsilon relatives, which is 6. Well, that's really square root of 2, right? So now I have 120 pi square root of 2. Now I'm going to get the reflection coefficient. This is the bulk of this problem. So the reflection coefficient at the interface would be equal to a to 2 minus a to 1. Well, a to 2 in region 2 is 125 square root of 2. Right? Minus a to 1 and 35. It would have been easier if I would have left this right here as 120 pi and 1 fourth, but that's all right. And this is going to be 120 pi square root of 2 plus 30 pi. Now, everybody, do you all agree with me there? That is the reflection coefficient. Everybody here can see the pi's cancel. Do you all agree with that? I'm doing this in a way that's systematic. Hopefully, if you have a question, you must have answered it this way. Now, this is up to you. If the pi's cancel, I have that, you have calculus. I can, I can mess around with this and reduce the complexity. But it's not needed if you've got modern calculators. Can somebody give me that number? It's 0 0.7. Thank you. I used to fuss with that stuff no more. You got a calculator, why bother? It's a waste of time. I get down to that. Now, what's the transmission coefficient? Class, what's the equation? One plus one. Sure. It, it's, can, it's either 1 plus the reflection coefficient, or it's 2 a to 2 over a to 2 plus a to 1. These two will be identical. Since we have the reflection coefficient, I'm going to use it. Therefore, it is equal to 1.7. That'll bother some people. Right. That means the incident field is multiplied by 1.7 to get the transmitter field. The thing about this that I'm not saying is the actual value of the power density goes down. When, when the H field itself is calculated from that, you'll see that the power flow itself will go down. I can prove that, but don't ever worry about an E field greater than the incident value. It has nothing to do with the power flow. Okay, class? It's very important to remember that. So now I have these quantities, and so what did he ask for the E field in region 2? Uh, he asked for the transmitted and the reflected. All right, we have the reflection and transmitted coefficient. Let's get the reflected field first. If you don't mind, I'll put it up here. So we take a look at the reflected field. We take that equation there that I have, and I'm going to change the value. Matter of fact, if you don't mind, how about if I do this? No, I better leave that as the incident. 
the more I think about these things, the more I realize I can get into trouble. When I take a look at the reflected field, only thing I have to do for the 10 cosine of omega t minus beta z, the ax component, is take 10 and multiply it by the reflection coefficient. Do you all see that? As far as the magnitude goes, so I'm going to do that. So this is going to be 10 times the reflection coefficient, which is 0.7, or it would be 7, right? And it would be cosine, the omega t stays the same. And here's where a change happens. What happens to beta 1z? Good. Plus. It becomes plus beta 1z, does it? And it's still in what direction? Ax. The orientation doesn't change. Now what about the y component? There I have 20, right, times the reflection coefficient, or it will be double 7, or it would be 14 cosine of omega t plus beta 1z plus, is it pi over 3, 3? A y. That's, that's as easy as it gets. The only thing I'm doing is taking the magnitudes, multiplying them by the reflection coefficient on the wave, and it's orthogonal. Both the AX, the AX component and AY component are perpendicular to each other, right? And they're perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So I'm done with the reflected field. Does everybody agree with this? In the far back, can you still see? Are right, there any questions? Now, not you, Jay. Somebody else. Now, how do I go about getting the transmitted field? I'm going to erase this one. What, what, what do I do? Instead of using the reflection coefficient, what do I do for the electric field? The transmitted field would be what? Times that, it's just the transmission coefficient times the magnitudes. Do you all see that? There's one other change. Does anybody know? Not you. Well, it won't be beta 1, it'll be beta 2. You know, everybody follow me on that? The frequency never changes, remember that. When there's a propagating wave, no matter what media it's in, the frequency is the same. Wavelength will change, beta will change, but never frequency. That's important to remember. Never frequency. So here the transmitted field would be 10 times the trans reflect transmission coefficient, 1.7 or it would be 17 times cosine of omega t minus, this would be beta 2z, right? Ax, then it would be plus double 17, so 34 cosine of omega t minus beta 2z plus that phase constant of pi over 3, a y. Now I have the general form. I haven't gotten beta 1 or beta 2. But does anybody know probably an easy way to calculate at least the ratios? If, if, if I felt you would allow me to put you on the spot, I would call on somebody. Anybody, a lot of times people don't want to say anything because they think you're a loud mouth, but I'm trying to encourage participation, but I don't want to cause people to be nervous coming to class. Anybody at all? All right, Jake. Go on. Um, would you do this? Uh, omega times the square root of mu epsilon. One. Here, here's what he's on to. He knows it's lossless, right? And he knows if it's a lossless region, gamma is equal to the square root of j omega mu. Normally there's a quantity sigma, but sigma is zero, so it's j omega mu times j omega epsilon. Well, you got j omega twice, so you pull that in front of the square root. And you're left with the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. And here, write this down if you don't remember. So if it's a lossless region, and it doesn't matter if it's free space or not, then really the propagation constant is just j beta. And there, beta is equal to omega square root of mu epsilon of the region or beta is equal to omega times square root of mu naught epsilon naught times square root of mu relative epsilon relative. Do you all agree with me? How many do? Now here's the thing about this. They didn't give us a frequency. We can't get the exact value unless they give us more information like wavelength, something like that. But we can get the ratio of the twos. 
So if you look at this, right? Can anybody see another thing I could do to simplify this? I know you do. Tell me something about the square root of mu naught epsilon naught that rings true. What's the speed of light in free space? Three times um, 10 to the 8. That's right. But isn't it one over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught? We usually label the speed of light C, and it's 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught, right? And it's about, not exactly, Dr. Gross would be open for this, probably. It's about three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's not exactly 2.99, not something. But it's close, and we usually round it as that for practical purposes. So that means I can take one over square, or square root of mu naught epsilon naught and put one over c. That's what I'm going to do here. So it's really omega over c. And now, when we take the ratio of beta 1 over beta 2, what we get is omega right, over c times square root. And if it's beta 1, it's just square root of 16 over omega over c, and it's square root of 2. You all see what I've done here? I've simply gone ahead and put the omega over c for the omega divided by square root of mu naught epsilon naught. And then here, for region 1, when I'm using this, mu relative is 1, but epsilon relative is 16, right? Yep. Wouldn't it be, because that 2 is when you did mu r over epsilon naught, wouldn't it be mu r times epsilon naught? Oh, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. He's absolutely right. I should have taken a better look at this. This is going to be epsilon relative, mu relative, so it's actually 6 times 12. Thank you so much. And that saves me a little work. So really, this is going to be square root of 16 over 6 times 12. Now, I'm going to save this. You can go ahead and put 72 and 16 there. If you want to break it up, and this is up to you, I can divide by 2. I have 8 there, right? Then three, it depends how much you want to do, right? Then divide by two again, six, four. The reason I do that, square root of four is going to be two over the square root here of 18. And you can leave it as that. So that's the ratio of beta one to beta two. Then if you want to cast beta two in terms of beta one, well, or beta one in terms of beta two, you can use that ratio to do it. Do you all agree? Did he ask that, by the way, or not? No. This is important. What else did he ask? Uh, that was it. All right. Do you all follow me? The only thing he's doing is causing you to think logically. Uh, when you're dealing with electromagnetics, unless it's specifically indicated, you assume linear time invariant systems. Superposition holds true for waves. Wave 1, wave 2 incident in a region. If the resultant transmission of wave 1 is wave 1, 2, Wave 2 result would be wave 2, 2. You can say that the result of the two waves at the same time is just the result of the outputs of both. And that's what the ratio would be. Did you have another question, anybody? That's a fairly good one. Anything else? OK. Uh, we talked about reflection and transmission, right, last time for normally incidents. Did you have a question, sir? This is a quick one. Um, how could frequencies stay at a single wavelength change? Well, when you think about this, when a wave is propagated, well, free, the reason the wavelength changes is the velocity in the media changes. All right? The velocity in a media, fundamental velocity, this isn't a bad time to discuss this. Now, let me erase this. Frequency will always, always, always be the same. Never change for a wave. But, you better believe the wavelength will change. And this is assuming you're in a reference frame that is stationary. And I better not get into speed of light stuff. If you're we're talking about the same reference frame, media one, media two, if I'm standing in media two or standing in media one, what is apparent? Frequency is the same. But when you take a look, for instance, at velocity in general, it's generally omega over beta, right? And if it's, if it's a, a lossless region, 
the phase velocity is going to be really equal to omega over square root of omega square root of mu naught epsilon naught times square root of mu relative epsilon relative. And really what this means is that the phase velocity is 1 over square root of mu naught epsilon naught divided by square root of mu relative epsilon relative. I'm just canceling the omegas. This is fundamental. I'm assuming lossless here, just for, I could go lossy, but it, it's just complicated. Now, if you take a lake, look at this, the phase velocity on this would be C, the speed of light, because I have this term, divided by the square root of mu relative epsilon relative. So I can see when I go through different media, the actual velocity, phase velocity changes. For a given frequency, it will always be constant. That means that the wavelength will shorten because for a region that's lossless, you know wavelength would be the velocity of propagation divided by f. I can prove that if you'd like. But c over f is standard for wavelength of free space, and most people know that. So you can see if frequency is the same, right? then what we can find out is the slower the velocity, the smaller the wavelength. That's always the truth. You all see that? And that's the truth. Free space has the longest wavelength for any propagating phenomena. After that, it shrinks. But the real thing you worry about is frequency. Okay. That gives you everything. Uh, I mean, everything is cast in terms of frequency. The intrinsic impedance, I mean, the fundamental parameters. All right. Beta is always in terms of frequency. Did you have another question, anybody? Yeah. When I think of a wave and a you know, higher frequency, it's going to be more compressed, right? Well, that's assuming the velocity is the same, right? If the velocity changes, the wave will change. The wavelength will change, and the actual spectrum, spatial, uh, the spatial, whatever you want to call it, imprint will change. Do you have one? I don't have no. a question. Anybody? Else? No? All right. Now, you guys right? I, I'm really asking you this because after the goodness of my heart, I know that these kind of problems can trap you with power especially. Because I can give you the transmitted power and I'm going to ask for the incident power. And people start scratching their heads about what's the best way to go about it. Well, remember, when you're talking about power, you're really talking about E and H fields multiply, crossing each other. One's a conjugate, and then one half the real part, right? But I gave you a general equation for power. Do you remember? It was one half the magnitude for propagating waves with one component. One half the magnitude of E squared. I'm only going to comment on this. Divided by the magnitude of the intrinsic impedance, right? And then it's times the cosine of the phase angle of the intrinsic impedance in that media. Now that cosine of the phase angle will be simply cosine of zero for, no, for lossless regions. Then it's times e to the minus two alpha z. Usually you don't worry about that because you're not worried about how far it attenuates. That's usually the case. And finally, the last thing you do is just put the direction of propagation, the unit vector in the direction of propagation. Okay. Did you? Yeah, I heard. Did you have a good? Oh. Um, oh. Did you have a question? <laughs> Oh, I was just going to ask you if you can go over the tilt angle um, again. One of the problems from earlier in the homework. Yeah, uh, and you, we just can do for that the record, after that. just for the entire class, I will not ask a question about tilt angle. All right, and, and the reason I don't is because I teach electromagnetics, and I do radar work, and I do antenna work. Tilt angle is something. The only t It's a very specialized feature you want to use if you're talking about something like weather radar. Really what they normally talk about, if it's right, left, or elliptically polarized, or linear polarized. Now, in general, if you give me the problem, I'll tell you. I'll oh, I mean, if we're not going to be quizzed on it, then it's not. Huh? I, I don't really. I mean, know. if you look at the problems, the way you get tilt angle, you plot X and Y field components for about four or five points, and you'll see. I mean, you, but you get an ellipse. You all know what it, when I talk about an ellipse itself. So you look at the maximum extent of the ellipse, point there, minimum or the negative, and then draw a straight line through there and measure with respect to the x-axis. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing you need to do. But I don't spend time there. It's really um, unimportant. 
Okay? Anything else? It's a good time to do it. So we are almost done with chapter 6. We have to do oblique incidents, but before we do, I want to throw in something that's not quite in this book here, and it should be. It has to do with what, in fact, happens if you have a wave from, say, free space, and it hits a region that's not free space, but it's planar. And then it comes out in free space or another region. How do you go ahead and find out what the transmission and reflection coefficients are for that problem? Now, I want to draw it up, and then I'm going to talk about it. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you about it before I, I continue. And there are several ways to do this, but there's one easy way. So here I'm going to have a media. I'm going to call, well, doesn't have to be, but I'm going to call this air. And the region has a characteristic impedance of eight and not, which would be 125. And here I have a region, and this is going to be something else. This is going to be, you can call it a shield. It doesn't have to be turned out. And the shield has a thickness. We'll call the thickness of the shield L. And it has material parameters, epsilon relative, mu relative, and sigma. And then on this side, we have air. And here's the problem. And this is a good one. It's a real one. By the way, this is real. This is the beginning of shielding. Now, if I had a propagating electromagnetic wave, call this in the E direction here, it's going to strike this. We're going to make this point zero right here in terms of the Z direction. So this would be at minus L. Some of you are probably figuring out where I'm going with this. And I know if that's the incident field, I can write an equation for it. But if it hits, some of it's going to be reflected, right? Be reflected. And some of it's going to be transmitted, right? That would be the transmitted field, but there's more to it. That transmitted field, if this is lost, you could attenuate. Right? And then when it strikes here, some of this field is going to be reflected. This way, right? And some of this is going to be transmitted. And this would be, call it E transmitted one, E transmitted two. Now you all see this problem, right? And this is what really is the beginning of shielding. Like you put metal cases around a lot of RF equipment and stuff like sensitive equipment, so both they don't radiate as well as they aren't, they aren't affected by systems that are nearby. You all know this class. That is called shielding. They put thin wire around some because the wavelength of the things that would influence it are many, many times the dimensions of a thin screen. Do you know what a screen room is, anybody? Anybody have, you know what anechoic material is, anechoic is? Anechoic is absorbing, radar absorbing material fundamentally. It absorbs electromagnetic energy. That's a way to shield. It's expensive. Another way is just putting up something that's thick and attenuates a lot and reflects a lot. That's called... A sh that's a standard cheap shield, metal, stuff like that, okay? Anyway, getting back to this. Now, this has a direct parallel to something you did a long time ago. How many remember transmission lines? Everybody should, right? <laughs> I see the winces and stuff. If you could see what I see, there's some people, yeah, that, it's like, don't go there. Well, I have to go there because it's the easiest way. Well, when you had a transmission line, just go with it. If you had a transmission line of length L, right? Let's say the transmission, had, the transmission line had a characteristic of P to Z naught. And then you put a load here, call it ZL. And now you're going to connect something to it. But before you do, you would like to know what Z in it is, right? Are you with me on that? I'm going to remember those things from uh, back in the day. Yeah, that's a classic. And if you ever go for a job interview and you have electrical and computer engineer on your resume, one of the things that may come at you is this question, and here's why. They can get rid of people that are computer engineers in a heartbeat because they don't do this. 
And so if they're filtering people, and, and nowadays they do this a lot, believe it or not, especially with all the online courses that they have questions about what they really know when they go through them, they'll give you, has anybody taken a job interview and got questions recently at all? Uh, you have? Or not anything about like, I mean, was it, oh, sorry, was it technical questions? Okay, technical. never mind. Most of the time when you graduate with a bachelor's, master's, or doctorate, especially a master's or a bachelor's degree, and you're high tech and you're going to interview somebody, a guy will give you a series of questions. He might throw them out. And the reason he does this is make sure you are what you say you are. Because I've had, I know one person, my brother told me this, too, he had a kid from a 4.0 from business. How he got it, I don't know. Came, they gave him a job offer at an unknown company. I'm not going to say it's an hospital. And the guy was a disaster. He didn't know the first thing about a lot of basic business things. If you know anything about compound interest and doing things like this and expected value of return on investment, all these things and apparently writing, he was very bad at it. Maybe he just lapsed into some kind of a comatose behavior. But after that, they realized, we got to make sure these guys know what they're talking about. This was business, not engineering, but it's done in engineering. All right, now for that problem, do you remember what Zn was? If it's lossless, what was it? It was Z0, the characteristic impedance of the region, right? I mean, the, the transmission line. Then it's going to be times Zl plus J, right, times Z0 times the tangent of beta L, that would be beta in the transmission line, divided by Z naught plus J Z L times the tangent of beta L in the transmission line. How many remember that? Right? That was your standard go-to equation. Right? To find the input impedance of a transmission line. Why would you need the input impedance? Well, if I had a standard type of arrangement where I had a source resistance and I had some V naught source right here, I had to figure out that input impedance, right? In order to figure out what voltage would be developed right here that would be the summation of the propagating and the reflected wave. Do you all remember that? And that got a little complicated if you remember, right? That was Dr. Wentworth's classic problem. He loves it. Did anybody here have Dr. Wentworth for EMAG1? Remember him doing this? He does it. I almost, I'll put money. He's done it since he's been there. He loves that problem. I don't know if Riggs would do it, and I'm not sure about Adele Bashir, but I know Wentworth. How, how many had Adele Bashir? Did he do that too? No? Uh, Riggs? Anybody have Riggs? Who had me? Anybody? Did I do that? If you don't remember, I did it. <laughs> I did it, but that's all right. We use Smith charts a lot in my class. That's normally where my default is. This is, this is the beginning stage. That's how you get Z in on anything. Now, here's the thing. I can go through and write the field equations in this, both reflected in, in incident reflected field, things going that way and this way. I can do it here too, and in here you only have one going out. I can match boundary conditions. You'll get about, let's see, you get uh, four, eight. So you're going to have eight equations and you have to solve for, for really, uh, you have to equate everything with reflection transmission coefficients. But when you do all this, this is what comes out of it. So this is the thing I want you to take out of it. As long as you remember that, I can move from where I go. That's what I'm using as my template. When I come here, what I'm going to do is this. I have an incident field, but what I'll do is this. That's still L. I'll look in here, and I'll say the input impedance, I'll call it eta in. All right? It's a function of L. And eta in as a function of L will be equal to, and I'll put lossless first in this case. This is if the material in the shield is lossless. It'll be identical to that. So it'll be the characteristic in the shield. Call this beta S for the shield. Then I'm just replacing those values 
Then this is air, so it has A to naught plus J, and then it would be A to shield times the tangent. Uh, and here it's going to be beta in the shield, so it would be beta S times L over beta S plus J beta naught times tangent beta in the shield L. In other words, if it is a lossless region, my A to N in this shield at this point would be this. You follow me? And that would look like A to 2 in the actual reflection and transmission equations. How many understand what I've done there? Are you good with that? Do you understand? I mean, how, I mean, really, can you nod your heads or raise your hands so I can get an idea? You all understand? Does anybody not understand what I've done here? I'm just making this a problem that you've already seen before without going through all the equations. So I'm saying if I'm looking in at the incident at the beginning of the shield, this would be the, inst the intrinsic impedance I see here. It wouldn't be A to the shield or A to not, neither one of those. What it would be is this value because this has got a finite thickness and there's something on the other side that looks like a load, okay? Now, that's if it's lossless. Most shields aren't lossless, but some are in their reflective shield. What happens if it's lossy? The lossy uh, media. Lossy shield. Anybody? Well, remember, then what would this become? It would be A to N of L. Now it would be A to S, and let me go ahead and put down, when I say A to the shield, it's the intrinsic impedance of the shield, which would be square root of J omega mu over sigma plus J omega epsilon. But if it is a true shield, then we assume that sigma is much, much greater than omega epsilon, or it would be a good conductor like copper. And then A to the shield could be approximated as square root of J omega mu over sigma. Now you remember that approximation assumes now it's a good conductor. Do you all see that class? So that's what this is. Another thing happens if we're talking about the shield, a typical shield being a good conductor. This would be a good conductor. And that is gamma. Do you remember what happens for gamma if you have a big conductor? Well, it's equal to the square root of J omega mu times sigma plus J omega epsilon typically. But what happens if it's a good conductor? Do you remember? What do we do with this term? Do we need this term? No. It's so small compared to sigma, we get this, right? And then we see that the square root of j appears here. And I went through this. The square root of j is 1 plus j over the square root of 2, correct? And then you're left with the square root of omega mu sigma. When all is said and done, you get 1 plus j times the square root of mu, really, the square root of pi mu, pi f mu sigma. And here you find that alpha is equal to beta is equal to square root of pi f mu sigma. Do you all remember that? With me? And that's what it is for a good conductor. Now to adapt this formula, some of you remember that. Over here, now I don't have tan, I have hyperbolic tangent. Do you remember that coming in? We have a lossy shield. And I don't have a J, and instead of beta, now I have what? Gamma, don't I? I have gamma, which has got a real and imaginary part. So now it would be A to naught plus, I'm going to reduce this complexity in a sec, plus A to S times the tangent of, and now it's going to be gamma of the shield times L over beta of the shield plus a to naught times the tangent of gamma of the shield times L. Now the hyperbolic tangent function has loss included in it, okay? 
it does. And this is, would be the input impedance for any thickness shield. Now, I'm assuming it's going into A to naught as the load, but you could adapt that. I'll give you a general equation. I'll put it on one note, but I want to show you how you develop it. Are you with me? That would be the input impedance here. Why is that so important? Follow me on this. The input impedance says, my input impedance here is found by this equation if it's lossy, right? Correct class on this one? Now, if you've got that right there, I'm going to make a few other statements too in a second. But if you got that right there, now you can go ahead and say, if I have this, I can get the reflection coefficient there, but instead of using A to, a to shield, now I use A to input. It's the, always the impedance you're going into. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm going to write this down over there on the wall clear. Now, once you have that, I multiply. I, I can say the reflection plus the, trans, or the transmission coefficient is 1 plus the reflection. Do you all agree with that? I would have that value. I take the transmission coefficient times the magnitude of the incident field. Now I have the magnitude of the field here. With me? And that field will start decaying quickly because it's metal. It'll attenuate very quickly before it hits here. And when it hits here, the amount that actually goes and goes from this region to this region is really going to be the second, to get that value, it's going to be the reflection of the transmission coefficient from here to here, which would be 2 A to naught over A to naught plus, and you would use A to shield in that equation, not the input impedance. It would be actually A to shield. And you'll find the value of transmission coefficient there is about 2. All right, I'm going to try to find this in Wentworth's book, because this should be right here. He doesn't do it. I'm going to give you more information about that. Wait a second. Oh, I have to. That clock is right, isn't it? I'm looking at that one. Okay, that's what I need to know. Hang on for one second. See, this is a very practical application of the need to know reflection coefficients. So if you're looking at your book on page 527, there Wentworth, Dr. Wentworth's book, has all this, but he does one thing slightly different. If you look at his book, he doesn't use eta anymore for the equations. He uses capital Z. So he's trying to make that as close to parallel what you got for your transmission line problem. But the equations I'm doing right there is for the lossy part is the equation he has an example 925. And I hope you understand that when we're talking about shields, I'm going to make this very applicable. I know I sort of put a broad brush out here. But what I want to do is give you information you need to know to solve problems next. I'll, I'll simply take it and combine it down. I'm going to leave that up there. I'm going to make some comments. So this you get down. So here it's for a shield, a real shield. And this is, I like to call it metal, for a very good conductor. So sigma is much greater than omega epsilon. Here, what you worry about, usually you have free space here, free space here. You have a, a region with a given thickness L. It's going to have a value of sigma. That's the only thing you really care about. All right, really, epsilon relative, I can throw it in there. And you, mu you may need, though. Remember what I'm saying. For stainless steel, mu relative is about 1,000. It becomes an important factor, this one, for steel. So you're going to have these, and we'll call this the shield region. So I'm going to subset where this is a shield. And I'm going to call this just sub S. All right? And this is again free space here. This marker's starting to fail. But this one's not working. Well. Let me go back to this one. Yeah, that one's got it. 
And here we're going to have an incident field. And now we're going to go through this problem. My goal here is to get the electric field in all, all regions, all right? And then also place it transmitted and reflected here and reflected here. We've got the incident or the wave and the transmitted field here. Really what I'm worried about is this. I want the transmitted field. Okay. Now you see this perfect application of reflection and transmission. So here what I do is I start with A to 1, but now I need some parameters. I got A to not there. I got to get A to shield. A to shield itself is going to be equal to uh, the square root of J omega mu over sigma plus J omega epsilon. This will be approximated, if it's a good conductor, and we're assuming that, is simply equal to the square root of J omega mu over sigma. And if you want to, you can say this is square root of omega mu over sigma at an angle E of J pi over 4, 45 degrees. You don't have to do it that way, but it's helpful, and you'll see why in a second. So that's A to shield. Next thing I need is this, the input impedance. And that input impedance right there would be equal to, it's always going to be A to naught, so it's A to the shield times A to naught plus, I'm going to put the J, plus A to of the shield times tangent of gamma of the shield times L over eta of the shield plus eta naught times tangent of gamma of the shield times L. Remember, I'm doing this based on the parallels to transmission line theory. And if you go read through his thing on transmission line theory, how he develops the actual equation I put up there for Zenoch, it'll make perfect sense. It's the same exact development here. And that's true. And again, I better put down here that gamma of the shield is equal to Really, 1 plus j times square root of mu pi f mu sigma of the shield. Okay? Everybody? Now, next thing I want to do is say that this right here is an interesting quantity. Uh, well, this is not tangent, it's hyperbolic tangent. T-A-N-H. So this is hyperbolic tangent. I'm so sorry I didn't put that down. Your calculators, some of your calculators don't have what a hyperbolic tan function is. Uh, I don't know if the 93s do, but if you look, you can create a hyperbolic tan very easily with a couple exponentials. You don't even have to worry, it, though, worry about that that much. And I'll tell you why in a second, that generally speaking, hear me now, the bigger this argument is, the smaller the tan hyperbolic tan is. Now that's not quite true, but it's, <laughs> you're going to get into trouble. The reason is because this is complex. We'll talk about that more later. But generally speaking, this thing dies out. Now usually if it dies out, if you take a look I'll tell you what, I'm not even going to say that right now. I'm going to just say this is the go-to equation, but we're going to reduce it in a second. Right. So that's the, the equation you use. And one other thing that you need is you have to figure out how many skin depths thick this is. So when we take a look at a skin depth, all right, what we do is take a look at the ratio of the actual thickness here which I call L, over the skin depth. And remember, skin depth, uh, skin depth was equal to 1 over the square root of pi F mu sigma, right? And that is very small, typically. 
But if this ratio right here, if this is much greater than 1, then you can say A to N is approximately equal to A to shield. And I'm going to have to play with I know that what will happen is, as I make this argument get large, all right, as the thickness of the shield gets large, what this will reduce to is this. Maybe I said something wrong. Maybe this will be dominant. And if this term's dominant right there, then I got a to s squared over a to s. And this will be a non-dominant term. But I'm going to have to play with that some more. I'm pretty sure. I know what will happen. This, the input in, impedance of the shield will be a to s. Now, that said, the next thing I can do is get the reflection. I'm already over. I'm going to get the reflection coefficient right here. And I'm going to get the transmission coefficient at that interface. Do you follow me? Well, the reflection coefficient of region 1 here would be eta of the shield minus eta naught over eta of the shield plus eta naught. And the transmission of the coefficient would be 2 times eta shield over eta shield plus eta naught. I've got a point to make here. 99% of the time, the shield is many wavelengths thick if it's going to be effective. Or I should say many skin depths thick, all right? If the shield's going to be effective. Not all the time, but 99%. So this is usually approximated. And also, I'll say this. A to shield is usually much, much less than A to naught. Almost always, this is the truth. And if that's the case, then this, if you look at this, is going to be 2 eta of the shield divided by eta naught. Do you all follow me on this? Here, what I've done is taken a look, and I see that eta shield plus, if eta shield is much less than eta naught, then eta naught dominates down here. It's two eta shield over eta naught for the transmission coefficient. Do you all see that? Usually the way we do it. We'll use that to get the reflection if we need to reflect the field. And I'm three minutes over. Now, if you think about it, can you all figure out what the electric field would be just incident here, class? Here's the thing I didn't get to today. That field value will attenuate. You'll have to take that field value and it will attenuate as e to the minus alpha times the thickness when it hits this region. I'll go through this entire problem. It attenuates down to that point. Then you take the value of that field and multiply it by the transmission coefficient here, which is almost 2 all the time. Right, which is nice to know. So I take 2 times e to the minus, in this case it would be 2, I mean if I wanted the field it would be e to the minus alpha times the thickness L, right? And then it's going to be times the transmission coefficient there, which is this. I'll put this in one note so you can use, you can use the approximation of the actual values and I'll give you some references and ask you to do some problems. Now, another question you all had is what about the quiz on Friday, right? Quiz on Friday technically covers everything. Usually you need to understand prior stuff to first. It's going to be focused on the last couple of lectures, homework, sorry. So E-field propagation, reflection, all right? And like the problem you did today, both power, electric field strength, and magnetic strength in different regions. And I think you can handle this. If I had a basic problem, if I asked, say this shield was infinitely thick, if I asked for the E field somewhere inside here, you could get that because you could figure out transmission for a coefficient, you could figure out the attenuation. All right. I'll give you more homework to make it um, make it clear, and then I'll see you Friday. Does, it, does anybody need to see any of our questions now? Anything?